Over the past three years, we've planted hundreds of different plants here at Goldie Farms. And all these here, I filmed just this morning. So this is what they look like in late June. And a question that came up a lot in my video on how to design your food forest was, how do I select my plants? So in this video, I'm sharing everything I wish I knew about selecting plants before I started my food forest. Now, before I go too much further, I wanted to share one of my sources of inspiration, and that is my friend Catherine's Rose Cottage. It is absolutely magical. This is what her garden looked like this spring. Notice the diversity, layers, and density. She's been collecting and planting for over 30 years, and she still discovers new plants to add. So as we dive into the world of plant selection, keep in mind that if any of this starts to feel overwhelming, remember that you get the rest of your life to discover plants and add them to your food forest. So just enjoy the process and watch your garden transform. Okay, now back to Goldie Farms. I realize as I was creating this video that there is just so much information to unpack on this topic that I'm sure I'm leaving things out. So please add your tips on how you select plants in the comments. Here at Goldie Farms, we base our plant selection on four factors, form, function, lifespan, and most importantly, what nature wants to grow. Relatively speaking, Goldie Farms is small. In fact, I finally measured the food forest itself and it's only about 2,000 square feet. So we wanna make use of every single inch. Not only so there's more food and things for us, but also because nature likes to grow something wherever there's bare soil. So we might as well grow something that we really want rather than something that we don't want. And while packing in this many plants may appear crowded, lots of plants close together crowds out undesirable plants and resist disease. Kind of similar to how our bodies better resist disease when we have lots of healthy gut flora. So let's pretend this is our garden here. We could fill it in with a single layer row of annuals such as tomatoes, corn, and squash. Or we could think vertically and we could think in layers. We could plant carrots, sweet potatoes, and radish as our root layer. We could then intermix some shrubs and herbaceous layers such as ceanothus and calendula. Within this whole mix, we could start adding some low fruit trees. This could be things like mini fruit trees and dwarf fruit trees. You can then even add tall trees. For our tall trees, we allow our figs to get tall. We also use acacias. You can then grow vines up your tall trees so long as your trees are sturdy and fully grown. We tried this once with a baby acacia shoestring and it did not go well. You want to make sure that the tree can support the weight of the vine and is mature enough that the vines won't girdle its growth. And of course ground cover. Always keep your ground covered with something. We use mint as a ground cover because we get so little water it's not an issue of being invasive here. We also use strawberries, native and non-native grasses, and in areas where the soil isn't yet built up we just cover it with wood chips. And then we have an emergent layer, which isn't featured here because these are trees that stand way above the rest. And that would be our redwood trees, which can eventually get 300 feet tall. We'll be long gone at that point and the food forest will take on a whole new form for the next generation. Next, when choosing what plants we want, I'm also thinking about what does the plant do? What's its function? Obviously, we want plants that produce food, so we want fruit and nut trees, olive trees. We want to grow things for medicine like calendula, yarrow, mugwort, valerian. And then I'm also trying to look at where can I use plants instead of having to buy things like structures. So for example, rather than shade cloth, we're planting acacias for light shade. I've seen nopalis used for fence structures, using trees to hold up vines. So how can you use a plant to fulfill a role in a way that's regenerative? We also plant a lot of plants to feed the soil. So these are plants that are really leafy or woody and need to be pruned back like every fall. Things like lavender, salvias, ceanothus. Nitrogen fixers is a big function of plants that we're looking for. And I've created a spreadsheet where I keep track of, well, I'm trying to keep track of what I have growing here at Goldie Farm 
arms. This is something I wish I had done at the beginning to keep track of everything, but also to some extent, it becomes fairly intuitive. I'll put a link to the spreadsheet in the description for those of you who like to work this way. You can make a copy of it and you can also suggest edits to it. We also plant food and habitat for beneficial insects and wildlife. We plant strawberry trees, toyon, agastache, we also plant things for repelling or trapping harmful insects, such as marigolds and onions. We used sunflowers to detoxify our soil. And of course, we use lots of evergreens to create a privacy screen and it makes the garden inviting year round. Not only are we designing for what the plant does and the space it takes up three-dimensionally, but you can also think four-dimensionally and consider how long the plant will live and when you can harvest from it. If we were to plant an orchard, we would have to wait several years before we can harvest anything. But if we were to plant annuals between our trees, we can enjoy a harvest the very first season. We can even be strategic about selecting trees based on when you can harvest. For example, we have several apple trees. A Dorset apple, which would be ready to harvest in mid to late June, Anna apples in late June, early July, and then a bounty of Sierra Beauty and Pink Lady apples in late September and early October. So rather than having the same type of apple tree and getting all our apples at once, we've set ourselves up for a successive harvest. We're also thinking long-term of how we envision this forest to be in many years. Here in this consortium, we have this little fig tree shaded from the hot southwestern sun by this shoestring acacia. The shoestring acacia will live at most 30 years, but this fig could easily live for 100, and we'll be pruning this acacia back as this fig gets larger and hardier, essentially feeding the acacia to the fig until we finally harvest the entire acacia for wood and are left with a really healthy, mature fig tree. In the same consortium, we have a ceanothus, which can grow pretty thick, but we've limbed it and thinned it to allow enough light to get through to grow corn, calendula. Earlier this season, we were growing arugula and sweet peas. And of course, there's lavender and rosemary year round. In our climate, sun protection is really helpful for these plants, protecting them from the intense wind and sun. The same ceanothus is also protecting this tiny oak tree which if we want, we could use this ceanothus to help get this oak tree started. Oak trees can live hundreds of years and the ceanothus would be long gone by then. Lately, there's been a lot of talk about AI, but what I'm really interested in is NI or natural intelligence. That's how I like to garden. I want to co-create with nature because when you enter into a collaboration with Mother Nature, you start to intuitively know what to plant and you end up creating something that's so much more beautiful, dense, resilient, and creative than you would if you were just going on your own logic and spreadsheets and all that alone. Granted, those things are helpful, but allowing Mother Nature to do a lot of the work for you is how I really like to garden. So while our consortiums may seem a little complicated, to be totally honest, a lot of it is just the annuals that we've scattered seeds every year and then they just pop up. So before it rains, we like to go out and scatter lots of seeds. And after last winter's rain, which was the first real rain we had in at least two years, in the spring we had arugula, calendula, radish, so much cilantro, artichokes just pop up where they wanted to pop up. Those seeds were there. They're the great great grandchildren of seeds we scattered over the years and they just re keep repopulating and they get hardier and hardier every year. The more genetic diversity you have in your food forest, the more resilient it will be. So we're constantly gathering seeds and collecting cuttings. Our fridge is full of seeds and scions. And we have this little nursery set up just for cuttings because it takes a lot of cuttings to get something to grow. To me, I think the best place to get seeds is from food you purchase at your local farmer's market. These seeds are more likely to be adapted to the conditions of your site. You can also get seeds from neighbors and friends who live nearby. We do start some seeds indoors, but since we're getting a lot of seeds for free, we just direct seed them into the garden. We scatter them in prepared beds and cover them with cut grass. 
When it comes to purchasing plants, I recommend starting with hardier plants that you know will do well to begin with. And then as your soil improves and you gain confidence, you can branch out from there. One way to find out what does well in your area is simply getting in the habit of taking walks around your neighborhood and observing what's thriving around you, what's in bloom when, what do lots of people seem to be able to grow successfully. Stick to what grows well in your zone and don't try to fight nature like I did with these California wax myrtles and these cold hardy kiwis. Both of these were from local nurseries and I'm pretty sure they're for this hardiness zone but I've never seen anyone successfully grow these plants here and they do not like the heat so they look okay until we get that first you know 100 degree day and then they don't look so great and despite that I just kept trying to grow them because I really wanted them and you'll be much happier if you just work with nature and grow what she wants to grow. When you're buying plants from a nursery, that's kind of the most expensive way to get plants. So I recommend if you're buying something you're not super familiar with, just get maybe one or two or three. Don't get a whole bunch before you know how it does. If you try a few and they do really well, then buy more. But first see how it does before you go gung-ho on something. Generally speaking, plants that have been bred to be really sweet and tender, those plants that we really like, they're more vulnerable because we've bred out bitter tastes and thorns and things like that, those natural defenses. Giving them a little buddy like an acacia or a salvia is gonna help defend them from those pests and give them a greater chance. So just give nature lots and lots of options and let her kind of figure out the rest for you. Now, before I conclude this video, I wanna say one more thing about fruit tree selection. With fruit trees, don't forget to consider your chill hours. Chill hours refer to the total number of hours between 32 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. There's this magic that happens during these temperatures that scientists still don't fully understand. But during these chilly hours, there are hormonal responses within the tree that allow the buds to blossom into flowers and the flowers to then become fruit. Here at Goldie Farms, we receive around 700 to 800 chill hours. So we want to stick to that chill hour or below, but not too low because if you go too low, you can have issues with your trees blooming too early. One thing you can do is simply call your local nursery and ask for their recommendation on your chill hour range. Chill hours also vary from year to year. And so our strategy for dealing with changing weather conditions is diversity. Diversity is the key to a resilient food forest. If we happen to have significantly less chill hours one year, we still get fruit from some trees, just not all of them. Now, some of our trees are self-fruitful, but others need a pollinator, and that information, along with chill hours, can be found on the tag of the tree when you buy it. Also be aware of what your neighbors are growing because they may have the pollinator pair you need, so long as it's within 100 feet of your tree. Now this video covered a lot of information about selecting plants for your food forest and I'm sure there's even more information out there so please leave your tips in the comments below so that together we can all help each other create thriving food forests. Most importantly, have fun discovering the plants, allowing certain plants to come to you from gifts, from friends, and from the adventures you go on discovering new nurseries and new places. Don't forget that you have your entire life to discover plants, so don't feel pressure to figure it all out at once. Allow yourself the chance to discover and co-create with the plants that come into your life. Thank you so much for watching and for being a subscriber, and I'll see you next time at Goldie Farm.